Tonight, I'll be heading over to 1010 room. Right off of 10th and J, 1010 is a small but tasteful hole in the wall. If handcrafted quality cocktails is your thing, not to mention the kitchen has some sort of discreet reputation of actually being able to dish out some plates of heavenly goodness, but that's if you're able to catch them before they shut down for the night, usually around 10 p.m., but the bar's always open till around 2 a.m. Thank God. And meeting me there, Justin Ames, a friend of a good friend of mine, He's currently the editor of the online magazine, The Velvet Rocket, which primarily focuses on a mixture of traveling, exploration, as well as documentation of conflicts in war-ridden areas of the globe. So this guy should be good for a lighthearted conversation over some drinks and a good meal, right? Well, we have the drinks and a good meal, but my guess is he has some pretty badass stories to tell. What's up, man? So up? thank you for taking the time to come out here on a lovely Sacramento night. Absolutely. Beautiful ambiance here. So I would ask if this was a, a regular spot for you, but obviously you're not a you're not a regular here. I'm not a regular. No. Okay. But First time here, actually. But you're from the general from area. General area. So yeah. not Sacramento per se, but no. you've, you've been to Sac. A few I have been to Sac. Okay. lived here for a few years, but I wouldn't say right. I'm from here. Okay. All right. So the, I, I'm assuming this is not your first time at like a Sacramento bar. No, right. absolutely not. No. Okay, all right. And uh, were you born and raised? I was actually there? born in Santa Cruz, but I grew up in a tiny little town in the Sierra Foothills called Oregon House. But I guarantee you no one has ever heard of that place because it's tiny. But yeah, that's for some other. Yeah, it's a tiny little town up in the place. Probably the closest town somebody might have heard of would be Grass Valley or the Bottom City. So when you came like to this area, you already like kind of like a what, teenager. Or? Well, actually, I went to UC Davis. Oh, okay. Yeah, and then after after I graduated from Davis, I ended up working for a uh, insurance company in Sacramento. Believe it or not. Okay. Yeah. So how did uh, I mean you're a photographer at this point? Yeah. You uh, among other things. Among a, a retiree, <laughs> should, that should be like the first. <laughs> The first point on your life. You retired by the age that you were, what, 37? 37, yeah. yeah. That's uh, that's the American dream right there. That's what everybody's trying to get to. That, that's what I'm trying to get to. So yeah. to be retired at 37, that's that's pretty fortunate. And you're just traveling the world, taking photographs? I'm traveling the world, and uh, I've got sort of a side project. I love doing uh, photojournalism. I, I study international relations at university, and so I've always kind of been interested in, you know, war and conflict and exciting things like that okay. so it was sort of an easy path for me to gravitate towards doing that so you went from working for an insurance company to going to third world <laughs> country you could even say that because i worked for an insurance company i ended up doing third world it's just because it's so i was so bored to death yeah you know it's funny because when you're when you're going to school like in elementary school they're telling me oh yeah you go to college to get this degree so you can have an important job sitting in an office doing something and junior high same message like yeah you know if you want to succeed in life you got to get an education go to university and sit behind a desk and same thing in high school and so the whole life is just getting fed this thing like you got to go to university so you can sign a, sit behind a desk in school so I was like, okay i went along with that and no otherwise so go to university uh like i said i studied international relations graduate get the desk job and I was like within a weekend I was like oh my god this is absolutely miserable I hate this I'm not geared up for this at all so I mean you were able to invest get ahead of the of the grind yeah and that's a I mean long story short that's how you're able to do yeah I just like I said I, you know I didn't make a fortune I never made six figures or anything like that but I just saved everything I could and uh, because I'd already gotten all of my mistakes out of the way in the past 
you know, I, I don't want to blow my own time, but I think I'm a pretty good investor now. And so I was able to uh, make some pretty good calls and got to the point where it was throwing out enough income that I, I couldn't live lavishly, but I could live where I could choose how I wanted to live. I mean, essentially, you're just being smart with your money. You know, you're not going to Vegas and dropping, yeah. you know, ten thousand dollars on yeah. Red Twenty One or whatever. I don't like losing money. Okay, no. right. Understand. I have. I have. Yeah. At what time frame between you retiring and then you traveling and uh, being in like foreign countries? Like, what was the time frame between the two of doing all this? Actually, I. Um, the co I worked for five years for an insurance company right after I graduated from UC Davis. And I had the misfortune of graduating right into a recession. And so I would never have chosen to work for an insurance company because it's the most boring work you can imagine. But that was, that's what was available. So I'm doing that. And I was able to make it for five years because I was working with a, a bunch of other young guys that you know, were fun to hang out with. And it, it, was, it was enough to get me through it. But after five years, I couldn't handle it anymore. So I essentially self-sabotaged myself and got out of that. And uh, I actually said, okay, I, this is miserable. I need to go back to grad school and like, you know, advance my career somehow and get out of this. I was still sort of buying into the, the idea that you could like have a nice career and all that. Um, so that was in 2007, I left that job. And I left that job. I, the nice thing about that was I left that job and I had a fair amount of money saved up and I also had a lot of free time. And how often is it that you have free time and money? Because usually you've got one or the other. you got the free time and no money right. or money and no free time. Right. So I was like, I've got money and free time and I'd applied to grad school in London it's, uh, called the University of Westminster. That's where I was going to do in London. But it was like eight months or so before I started. So I had eight months of free time and money. So I just like, I'm going to go for it. I'm going to do everything I want to do that I've just been putting off for so long. So I actually made a list of all these things I wanted to do. Like from like little things to big things. I just started knocking out the list. And um, I said, you know what? I've always been curious about Afghanistan. I'm just going to go to Afghanistan. I had no idea. I don't even, I don't, honestly, I don't even remember how I decided like I, Afghanistan. Like that's where I got to go. But I, so I, Afghanistan is, you know, you said to yourself, I, I want to go to Afghanistan. You know, yeah. this, this is something that I've been wanting to do. This is after the recession, during the recession. This is 2007, so this is actually like at the height, right the before height, height of the, the real crash. estate bubble. Yeah, height of the real estate bubble. So the war's still going on, but it's simmered down a little bit, right? Yeah, it was. Things are starting to go wrong then. It wasn't like as bad as it is now. Like places I went, you can't go now. Um, oh, really? But it wasn't as good as it was like right after the Taliban fell. It was sort of. So I figured that it's maybe gotten a little bit better now, but it sounds no, like no, it's no, getting no. worse. A lot of places I went, or, yeah, you can't go. Yeah, it, it's gotten steadily worse. Despite what you read, it's gotten steadily worse. Yeah, and it's so weird because you don't hear about it anymore. You know, it's yeah, it's funny. Like, Afghanistan is like completely out of the news, but I mean, like if you imagine this as representing the country of Afghanistan, like at least half of it is a no-go zone. No-go zone, no. You can't go. It's just the Taliban controls it. You know, still. Yeah. I so mean, they were they were they've been pushed back, but they're very persistent, and they just keep gaining ground. They're just grinding it out, and they've got much more patience than we do. I mean, they live there. And then, does ISIS come into play at all there? Yeah, I mean, again, if this is a country of, ISIS, of Afghanistan, ISIS has made inroads over in the eastern part of Afghanistan. They're, a lot of them infiltrating from Pakistan, and it's kind of interesting because the Taliban and ISIS have been really going at it and slaughtering each other. And it's sort of like the business of the enemy of my enemy is my friend, because the United States has actually been fighting on the same side as the Taliban against ISIS. Now. Now, yeah. It's funny how things work out that way. That's funny, yeah. Well, you know, politics makes strange bedfellows. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. Um, so, you know, Afghanistan's on your bucket list. You're going to this place pretty much at the height of tension. Yeah. And you get there. Do you know anybody there? Yeah, what do you, what I do know you anybody. Do? I actually flew into Pakistan, which is another, you know, dodgy place. Right. And um, went up the Khyber Pass and ended up in Afghanistan proper. And I'd hired a, a fixer to sort of show me the road because I didn't know what the hell I was doing. And um, that fixer, like, you know, a fixer knows who to bribe. Who, you know, which areas to avoid, who to look out for, you know, who to get permission from to go through. Like, just for example, going through the Khyber Pass, 
Kyber Pass is completely controlled by different tribes. The government has no authority over so if you don't, you know, if grease, you don't know anybody, right? If you don't grease the wheels of the tribes, you're gonna have big problems because there's so much smuggling and stuff that goes through the Kyber Pass. And so, you know, the fixer I hired got me through the Kyber Pass and I thought, fascinating area. Yeah, you know, you've got basically these different tribes control this area. Each tribe has its own compound, its own secure and fortified compound. And so you go at the Kyber Pass and like there's this fort over here where this tribe lives. It's almost like Game of Thrones. You know what I'm saying? Or like some Honestly it sounds like South Central LA. <laughs> or that, yeah. <laughs> Except they don't have things fancy compounds and such too. Right, 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 right. Uh, so yeah, you you gotta know somebody to get up through there. Um, so, so, I get, so I mean were you photography at this point? Were you a photographer? No, I almost I almost I just went as a tourist. Like I just went because like this is cool. I'm interested in this. So you're some like, you know, young kid out there in Afghanistan they have eight months to kill before you start school and you're just like, you know what, I'm I'm sightseeing. I'm sightseeing. <laughs> but even Afghanistan was exciting. I mean like I uh, I almost got taken out by an IED in Afghanistan because I hit the car directly in front of us. And then uh, I ended up in an ambush. It wasn't directed at me, but I just ended up like in the middle of it uh, in Afghanistan. So Afghanistan was certainly exciting. And but. that, you know, you know, if it was me out there for the first time, not knowing anyone, and being in an area that's not controlled by the government, and you're around these different tribes, yeah, and then you almost get taken out by an ID. You know, I'm on the first plane Play ride back, back back home. I don't know if you would be. Nope. I don't know if would be. Yeah, I don't know if you would be on the first flight out of there because I flew actually across the country. I went out to Herat, which is in the far west, and I flew out there. And uh, I got in the plane, and this guy came in the plane next to me and sat down. The most sketchy looking dude. Like you'd swear this guy was an Al Qaeda. <laughs> Like everything you can imagine, like in a profile. I'm on a plane right now. Things yeah. are not adding up no. well. It's a, oh, it's security is a joke. Like I just gave the guy a bribe. I just want like bypass the whole thing. Like there's no security whatsoever on these Afghan flights, um, which I thought was convenient at the time. But then this guy gets sits down next to me, and it looks like the most not so convenient. He looks the most like <laughs> sketchy guy possibly. Got sweat like pouring. I mean, you couldn't possibly fit the profile of, like a suicide bomber so better than this guy. Okay, he's got this big bag on his lap. And he's super protective. Of it. He's sort of like, like, like super edgy. I'm thinking, oh god, okay. I'm sitting right next to a suicide bomber. You know, at least he'll be fast. Because like, when the bomb goes off in his bag, like at least like, um, I'll be, I, I'll I won't feel anything. Exactly. I'll <laughs> so at least it's that. I'll take a little bit of comfort in that. Um, and so I was sketched out by this guy because he was given like off every vibe of like this is trouble. Um, and then his bag started moving. This guy's got something alive in his bag. And like he looked down at it, he opened it up, he had a chicken. <laughs> a chicken in his bag. And I was like, oh man, I am I'm way far from home. Right, this right. is not my deal. This is, we're not in Kansas anymore. Yeah. And you know what's hilarious is that the guy ended up being completely normal. He spoke fluent English. And so I ended up talking to him. He was like the most chill, like normal guy possible. Like, I, I mean, I don't know if you realize this or not, but you just scared half the people on this flight right now. <laughs> It's it funny because he, he was probably the most normal guy on the plane too. It was super funny. He's probably looking at you like, I know. <laughs> it's funny. Yeah, I did it on purpose. <laughs> that would have been funny if he said that. Um, anyway, so I was, we're sitting there with Tashi and I look out at the wing of the plane and have all these weird patterns on it where the, there are these weird bolts in different, running off in different directions. And uh, I thought, oh, that's kind of weird. I mentioned something to the guy, like, oh, that's kind of weird. You know, how like, they got all these weird patterns. And, and he looked over at it. He was like, oh, yeah, that's where they patch over the cracks. I was like, what? They patch, the wings were cracked from metal fatigue. Oh. And they, they just, like, put this plate of metal you're, over you're it. You're talking about the wings on the plane. I the thought you were talking plane. about the runway. Yeah, the wings on the plane. That's not good. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what I want to see before take Yeah, off. I was like, oh, great. So, yeah, that's that's what flying in Afghanistan was like. So, Man. when you say you want to take the first flight out, maybe not. <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe not. Maybe yeah. we'll, we'll take we'll go by sea. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that was sort of my introduction to flying in Afghanistan. But, but, so, you went there as far as, like, you know, something that you've been wanting to do for a while. When did the... Side career coming to play as far as photography and okay. documenting so, stuff. So, 
I, I took a lot of pictures. I took thousands of pictures of it out there. And I wrote about it. As a tourist. As a tourist, yeah. Um, and I wrote about it and, you know, shared some of these pictures around. And it had, like, a really favorable reception. Um, and it never even occurred to me that somebody could actually do something like this. Um, as a living. As a living, yeah. It never even occurred to me. How did the uh, photography and doing that as a... I guess that's a living coming to play. Okay, so was, the Afghanistan thing went down, and I was like, man, this is awesome. I absolutely love this. This is really cool. And so I, I said, I start, I wrote about it, shared some pictures, had a positive feedback on it, and then I started grad school, and when you're a student university, you really don't have to work very hard at all. Like, I could spend just... And a few hours a week doing university stuff. And the rest of the time was just free time on my own. So I traveled. I was I was living in London at the time, going to university there. I basically traveled nonstop at the time. Um, so I was just going to like one one horrible place after another. You know, one. You know, but it, but is this like in between semesters or? Yeah, this, no, this is during school. Like this is during school. Yeah, like you know, I skip classes or whatever. It's so easy. It's like, <laughs> um, especially like for a grad degree. It was just such so little effort, you know. I was just, I was going, I was traveling all the time. It was kind of funny. This university I went to, uh, Jihadi John of ISIS, the famous ISIS guy that was beheading all the hostages. The one, the one that's dead now? Yeah, okay. he was actually a classmate of mine. Really? Yeah, not in the same program. Did you talk to him? No, I, I never knew him. Okay. Um, Did you see him, at least? I, I'm sure that I passed him in the hall. Okay. Because I was in the international relations program, and he was doing computer science, and at the university, those programs were right next to each other. Like, oh. the, the classrooms were right next to each other. So I'm sure I passed him in the hall at some point, but at the I'm time, assuming the decapitation class was right next door? Or? Yeah, you know what? I, I never faced I never that. I would skip that one. Yeah, I would skip that one. Um, but it's just kind of one of those interesting oh by the ways um, anyway it was a joke it's super easy like I had to turn in like a couple papers a semester and you know it was nothing so I, I just traveled all the time and I was going to all these places and writing about them and um, different uh, newspapers and magazines started contacting me and saying hey we really like your work can we publish it um, and they always start out with the same thing it's like oh we'll, we'll give you exposure you know no money of course but we'll give right. you exposure with right. you Internship. Yeah, it's just a way to not pay somebody. Right. Um, but I, I didn't care. So I, I started out doing that. And, uh, you know, I got little nibbles of interest here and there. It's just like anything. You start building momentum, you know. I, like, these people like my work. And then because these people like my work, then these guys found out about it. And I made more and more connections I was doing this over time. And, um, you know, eventually... I started doing like, you know, I'd make $100 here, $150 there, $200 there. And then, you know, over time, the dollar amount started going up and I started making more connections. And I realized like, well, these guys like this kind of stuff and these guys like this kind of stuff. And so when I would go out and do something, I'd have a pretty good idea of who I could give and what to. And I wasn't struggling so much, you know, I pretty much would get, be guaranteed to make a connection you know, based on the material I produced. Um, and, uh, I mean, well, I mean, what type of places were you, were you going to? I mean, was it um, was it always the Middle East? or were you No, no, no. To... I mean, pretty much you pick a horrible place I've been there. I mean, I went to Haiti right after the earthquake, um, all over Africa. I've you know, been to Somalia. So it seems like that was kind of your objective. I mean, I mean, is it, were you like... Looking at the news feed on your phone and yeah, be like, I mean, "All right, well, as sick as tsunami that sounds, happened, exactly. so I'm going." Yeah, as sick as that sounds, like I'm, you read about something horrible in the news, I'd want to go there. Right. Yeah. I mean, I'm, if, if not you, then who's going to do it? Yeah. Nobody's going to want to yeah. do that. I mean, I, as sick as it sounds, like, I, I, I just found that world fascinating, man. I just, I was just attracted, like a moth to the flames of that kind of thing. Uh, so, like I said, you know, any place something bad's happening, I want to be there. Whether it's a war or a natural disaster or what, I want to be there. Now, but is it like you wanting to get the perfect shot, or you just being in that environment and gives you a rush? Or? It's sort of all of the above. I mean, there's something about wanting to be a part of history and seeing history firsthand, rather than just reading about the news. Like, I don't want to see a documentary. I want to be there firsthand and see it for myself. You know. 
and uh, why we're there, you know, it's hard not to appreciate like the photographic potential when you see the extremes of the human experience. I mean, something like that is really the frontiers of the human experience. I mean, it's the most raw thing you can imagine. I mean, in terms of ultra violence or human suffering or that kind of thing. Um, and again, I don't mean to sound like a psychopath, but it's it's very photogenic for one thing. Definitely. And uh, it's, it's, it's very. I mean, it's it's uh, filled with like emotion. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, there, there's a difference between reading a headline and seeing a photograph of a child right. with blood running down their face. Absolutely. You know, to get a message across like, hey, maybe we should stop what we're doing here. Right. And maybe pay attention to what's Absolutely. going on. Absolutely, yeah. It, it definitely puts things in perspective for you. I mean, if you think about the kind of things we worry about here in this country, you know, like traffic or something like that, and you go to a place like Sudan, where you know people are being massacred or starving death or something like that, it kind of puts you know the first world problems in perspective. It makes your priorities seem a little bit more clear. Yeah, right, right. yeah. It makes you appreciate what you have. Definitely, definitely. And then you know the same thing with like with me. You know, I'm thinking like, oh man, I can't deal with my nine to five. You know, there's got to be a better way. Yeah. But then you open up Yahoo News or ABC News. And you see what's going on in Syria yeah. or in Ukraine, and you're like, you know what? Maybe I don't have it that bad. Yeah. <laughs> <You know>? yeah. <laughs> Maybe I'm pretty lucky. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it definitely gives you a reality check for sure. Yeah. But I mean, as far as doing it for, I mean, for a living, is it just? I mean, the pay there? No, I mean, like I said, I, I would really struggle to live. On what I'm making now, I mean, I make you know ten, fifteen thousand dollars a year. I mean, I don't make a lot of money doing it. But the fortunate thing is because when I was working for the, the insurance companies and things like that, I was setting so much money aside, investing it, that that's really what's keeping me going. And the stuff for the journalism, yeah, it, it, you know, it's nice. You know, you love extra money, but I don't need it. You know what I mean? Because because of the internet and things like that. I mean. The newspaper industry, the magazines, things like that, has just been completely hollowed out. Like, I would never suggest somebody to go into it for a living now, because you're just gonna struggle and suffer your whole life. Uh, but for me, it's something I can do as uh, almost like a hobby. You know, if that makes sense. Like, it's an interesting sideline for me. Is it? It's something I do because I think it's interesting and I enjoy it, and hopefully I'm good at it by now. And uh, oh, by the way, it's nice to pay some of the bills. You know, I get the trips pay for themselves, essentially. You're right. Yeah. So, um, and then, you know, the people I meet are, are amazing. I mean, I've, I've just met some really incredible, amazing people doing that. And I really, I like that. I really enjoy that. I would imagine people that go through things that we can't even imagine. Uh, oh, yeah. I mean, some of the things, I mean, just some of the horrific suffering I've seen. Uh, I mean, especially... Some of the I've been spending a lot of time in Iraq and Syria the past two three years because the whole ISIS thing and um, some of the stories you know from the Yazidis or uh, people like that that have been you know, really heavily targeted by ISIS are just uh, is that, I mean is that ever a, a lingering thought in the back of your head like I think you know I could be on the other side of that video screen yeah, I on mean, my I, hands and knees. Yeah, I, I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, it's always sort of in the back of your mind about ending up, you know, on your knees in an orange jumpsuit with a knife in your throat. Like, uh, obviously, I don't want to. That's like, like the worst thing I can imagine. Uh, but yeah, they're just kind of sitting in the back of your mind, like, yeah, that could happen to you. Uh, Was there any close calls? Oh yeah, I've had a lot. Uh, yeah, I mean, there, there have been a couple times in uh, in Iraq, for example, where we are surrounded by ISIS and just. Normally when I go to Iraq, I usually hang out with the, the Peshmerga groups, which are the, the Kurdish fighters. And, uh, I mean, say what you will about ISIS, but I mean, they, they've got some really brilliant tacticians in their ranks, and they, they've launched some uh, some brilliant offensives, some brilliant attacks. I mean, they didn't get where they were for being stupid. I mean, they've got some, some talented people working uh, in their ranks. And so there have been times when, you know, I was with a group of Peshmerga, and you know they would launch ISIS would launch an ambush or surprise attack or something. We'd be completely circled, and uh, I know I, I would be very valuable, you know, to them. And I, 
I've been hearing that a lot of their major tactics and uh, strategic, uh, I guess, intimidation is uh, through social media, through online. It's very effective, you know, yeah, absolutely. They can make a video of them like entering the city, what looks like, you know, they have the, the masses supporting them. When in actuality, maybe they maybe only have like 20 soldiers. Yeah, and no, yeah. But the fact is, is that an Iraqi soldier is on their phone looking at this, seeing ISIS getting closer. Yeah. And, you know, they're pretty much saying, hey, you know what? I'm out. I'm out. Yeah. Yeah, and then, I mean, to give them their due, I mean, they, they were brilliant on social media. I mean, they were brilliant and mentally in that. So is that kind of like the new. Um, I guess the new generation of uh, warfare? I think so. I, I really believe so. I, I think that if you look at how much things have changed, it used to be that if you got a message, it had to be delivered through the traditional media outlets like the newspapers, Radio. Or like ABC, NBC, CBS. But now, you can distribute any message you want through, Facebook, through social media. And, uh, you know, other people have been doing that, but I think ISIS really perfected that and really demonstrated how easy and how effective that was. I mean, look how many people, for example, came from foreign countries to Iraq and Syria just to join ISIS. And that was because of the social media effect. You know, and they handled that really well. Is it because they have a lot of uh, younger fighters, younger people? Yeah, they had, they had a lot of younger people and also a lot of Westerners that responded to the message because ISIS, they, they were brilliant in the way they they uh, reached out to the West. Essentially they're saying like, look, if you're frustrated with your life, if you're not, if you don't feel like you're accomplishing much in your life, if you don't feel like you have a meaningful life, you can imagine you're rocking Syria and you can live like a dog, you know? A lot of young men, because a lot of the people that joined are losers. You know, there are people that, loser, that were losers in the West. They couldn't, you know, for whatever reason, they were not successful in the West. And if so they can come to Iraq and Syria, and they have, like, unlimited power. They can they can murder, they can torture, they can rape, they can kill, they can do whatever they want, with no inhibitions or restrictions at all. And that kind of, having that kind of power, and somebody that's always been a loser in, in the UK or France or Italy or whatever, that's very appealing to some people. Yeah. I'd say most people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, um, it worked. I mean, you see, like, the traditional, like, Taliban, Sunnis, you know, a lot of it is incorporated with faith and ideology and religion. Is that the same with ISIS, or...? They, uh, they certainly operated under that umbrella. I mean, they would cloak a lot of their actions in religious faith and things like that, but... You know, would you, would you would you really catch an ISIS militia, uh, militant, you know, in the mosque on Sunday? Really? No wonder every other country thinks Westerners are, to put it nicely, ignorant. To set the record straight, most Muslims pray five times a day. Unlike Christians, where the masses gather for worship on Sundays, for Muslims, the most important prayer of the week is on Friday, the day of gathering. Come on, man. If you're going to try and connect with people from different cultures, know your shit. You're like a professional, right? Eh, more like a novice amateur. So if that's the case, keep the drinks coming, barkeep. That'll help me recover from cultural mix-ups. Hopefully. Yeah, you know, worshiping and saying their prayers. Yeah. Or you know, would you find them, like, you know, in the streets trying to get some women or something? Yeah, like exactly. Um, I mean, when I was out with a Peshmerga, and they would come across the you know, ISIS fighters that were killed. I mean, you'd find ISIS fighters that had, like, I'll show you my, I'll show you right now, actually. Maybe you can put this in the video. Um, sorry, I, I hope this doesn't make for a bad video. Okay, yeah, I'll say it. Anyway, um, yeah, so we'd find these guys with drugs in them. Uh, so, and a lot of them were... were Petty criminals in, in Europe before they came over. You know, the drug dealers or you know, small low-level. So it doesn't sound like they're the traditional. You know, it's just an excuse. It's just a, it's just a cover. It's just a cover. It's just an umbrella. And I mean, is that 
because I feel like when I look at the Taliban or other traditional uh, terrorist groups, I mean, seems like they put an effort to try and stick to. I mean, obviously, I don't think anywhere in the Quran does it say that you should be beheading people yeah. that don't believe in your ideology. But with the Taliban, I mean, you do see the, at least for the most part, people trying to go to mosques and worship. Yeah. The, the Taliban, I think, are actually fairly practical. Um, it's a shame that we're actually in a war with them because the Taliban are, are, are actually a group I think you could negotiate with. Uh, whereas, uh, even then, though, I mean, you do have a lot of ignorance. And the kind of people that gravitate towards them are people that don't really feel like they have any options. I mean, Afghanistan is desperately poor. And, you know, you can grind it out as a farmer, you know, with your with your few goats and your few sheep, or you can join the Taliban and get a gun and make ten times as much money as you would putting goats around. I mean, even if you're not that religious or that fundamental, you don't even care about the Americans in your country. It's attractive just from an employment perspective uh, when you really don't feel like you have a lot of options. You being a professional photographer, going to these places that you've seen, traveling the world. I mean, whether whether you're getting paid or doing it because you like to do it. In your opinion, you know, you've seen a lot of stuff that most people these days haven't even witnessed, even yeah. As far as when does the fight stop? When can we have peace in the Middle East or peace worldwide? Um, worldwide understanding of different cultures, and just having a ceasefire. Is that something uh, obtainable at this point? Is it, I mean, can we get there? Or? I mean, it's a nice idea, and on an intellectual level, you can appreciate the, how wonderful the rule of beef had ever got there. But I think that we, as a species, have not evolved to the point where something like that is possible. I mean, perhaps I'm jaded because of things I've seen, but in my experience, you find human predators in every culture. And when law and order break down, those human predators come out and you see the most savage, vicious, sadistic, evil things that you can imagine. And I think that that, I think that's a fundamental aspect of humanity where even the, the most normal seeming people, for example, you do the Rwandan genocide. I mean, neighbors are slaughtering their neighbors. I mean, the people that had coexisted for decades or even longer and no one even friends. They started hacking each other in pieces with machetes. I mean, there's something in humanity that unfortunately drives us towards conflict. And I think that the natural state of humanity is savage and barbaric. And what we have now is, is somewhat artificial. And it's, it's wonderful to be able to sit here and not to worry about somebody coming up and shooting us or anything you know, like that. But I don't think that's natural. I think that as soon as you see law and order start to break down, it immediately turns to savagery. I mean, if you look at, like, for example, like Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans, as soon as law and order break down, you had anarchy. And people started killing each other and looting and raping and stealing. And unfortunately, I think that's a natural aspect of humanity. Um, so, what that... I think you were like, some of the Okay. So, um, kind of a... Bring some humor to that shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, kind of about, yeah. Yeah. Like, I that up. I, went, I was trying to bring... <laughs> lighten that up. I was trying to bring some, uh, a silver lining to that. Uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm a hip-hop fan, so I don't know if you've ever heard of the saying, uh, Tupac saying, you know, he was, he was the rose that grew from the concrete. Right. Do you see any type of uh, silver lining or beauty out of what you've experienced throughout the years? Yeah, I, I can't ask you. Uh, even in the most horrible places I visit, the most war-ridden, disastrous places, like, you know, for example, Afghanistan has suffered from war for decades. That's all they've known. And you will never find a nicer group of people. The, the overwhelming majority of people are decent, nice people beyond what you could possibly imagine. And I think the idea that most of humanity are good, I think is, is especially when you wouldn't expect it, because you know, you read the headlines in places like Afghanistan and Somalia, you know, people want the impression that they're all fanatics and suicide bombers. You couldn't be farther from the truth. I mean, really, 
99.9% of the people you meet are decent good people. And um, that does give me some faith in humanity. So moral of the story, uh, don't be afraid to get out there. No yeah. matter what you see or what you hear, yeah, go out and see it for yourself. I, exactly, because I mean, okay, yeah, you can get killed in Afghanistan, you can get killed across the street. Yeah. Yeah, what you'd rather do? Would you rather have an interest? I can have a heart attack right here. Exactly. Uh, exactly. I mean, look at all the, the crazy school shooters and things like that. You know, people going nuts. You know, right. And like, would you rather have just lived a boring conventional life and there are 2.5 kids in the morgues and all that? I'm sure that's interesting life. Yeah, I could get killed, but at least I had fun doing it. Right. You know? Definitely. Well, thank you for taking the time out tonight to uh, give us a little glimpse on a day-to-day -day life of a, of a photographer that's uh, out in the limb risking his life to get the perfect shot. Thank you. Man. Yeah, absolutely. Enjoyed it. Enjoyed it. I know that was a lot of content. <laughs> You hear that, folks? Don't be afraid to get out there and see the world. Sure, they might be the occasional boogeyman. The Middle East has the Islamic State, the Pacific is always on their toes dealing with the North Korean regime, and the Europeans keeping a close eye on Putin and his undercover KGB agents. But as harsh as it sounds, the world is always going to have that fear factor to it. But that's what adds to the excitement, right? So get out there, see some new things, taste some new things, have new experiences, but as a safety precaution, you might want to watch your freaking back and stay away from planes that have cracked wings or duct tape. Yeah, that's a pretty good idea.